another game, another same story, another subpar performance from the lads, another depressing day out in the stadium. Hello, darkness, my old friend. But it's good to see you guys again. How y'all doing? I think you described it. <laughs> well, we're here. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. Mean, the summer, I mean, what was it? Summertime sadness has officially come back to Orlando City, even though it started when the season started. So, yeah, I mean, the only thing that was keeping me going there for a while, I know Bryce did something similar. Was a twenty leg uh, parlay bet I put in on the Euros, and uh, it had to go and get blown yesterday. So that two dollars to win one hundred and fifty grand disappeared like that. Yeah. And it would have gotten completely destroyed today after Romania beat Ukraine 3 0. And then who was it? Belgium lost to Slovenia. No, Slovakia. Slovakia. Yes. One nil. So hey, it was going to come to an end eventually. You can have your hopes. I just wanted one more day. One more day out of it would have been, would have been good. <laughs> I would have felt good about myself picking like the first nine games. I would have cashed out for like three dollars fifty seven cents, maybe dollar thirty nine out of the first five games. Made so, your money back. Money. It is. I should have taken it. Where exactly? Yeah, well, was a uh, Parley's today's Bet sponsor? On. Bet online. Bet online is your number one source for the NBA Finals and Stanley Cup Finals this season. Every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads are available to you while the games are being played. When the games are finished, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker, or unwind with one of our over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Use our promo code BELIEVE, that's code B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online. The game starts here. Thank you to our sponsor of today's video, Bet Online. Make sure you guys use that welcome bonus code, Believe B L E A V. Um, yeah, so let's kind of get right into it. I said to you guys before, but if you looked at just the stats alone in this game, you'd kind of be like, "Well, why didn't why didn't Orlando win this game?" We looked better. <clears throat> Obviously, sixty-two percent possession, twenty shots, but guess how many we had on target? Only four. I'm going less Four. than that. Mm -hmm. I was going to say three. Three? Well, Ojeda had one, so I'm going one. And you would be correct, sir. Our one shot on target is our one goal. <laughs> um, we had a total of nine block shots throughout that game, 11 shots inside the box that can't seem to find their way on target. Um, who do you think had the better XG, us or LAFC? Probably us. That's, that had to be us. No, I think. LAFC. We had more shots. LAFC by 0. 0.1. We had 2.10 XG. They had 2.1 or 2.22. So great job from the lads again in the final third. Uh, did have a ton of passes, 605 of them accurate at 92%. And then 419 in the opposition uh, half. Again, did nothing with them. Um, and then 31% on successful tackles. So that just tells you how our our, defend, our defending was throughout that game. I'll let you guys go ahead and talk about that for a little bit. So the thing that sticks out for me is the 92% passing, but it's only 92% passing percentage because we're playing it safe balls all over the field, down one side of the field, in one corner of the field where there's three players standing there. So there's really no room for error. It was, uh, I believe, in the beginning of the second half, LAFC was happy to just sit there, let us attack. Well, not even attack. Let us have possession. They would sit in their box, and all we would do is pass side to side, slowly, and not really trying to find that penetrating pass, not making those penetrating runs. So it was just those easy passes that quite literally anyone could complete, and it wasn't really anything risky. So that 8% that we had inaccurate was us possibly trying to finally do something like that and LAFC just sitting back cutting off all the passing lanes and not letting us really get through or us not being creative enough so it was just a boring tedious game to watch because you just knew what it was going to be yeah I mean you can't even blame LAFC 
just because all throughout this season, it's just been mediocre after mediocre performance from us, especially going forward. So, I mean, it's understandable for them to just sit back and let us do whatever we want because it honestly comes to nothing. So, I will say LAFC themselves didn't even have a great game. I said it multiple times to you guys. There's no way this is one of the best teams in the league, uh, second in the West. I believe they are just behind RSL because they did not look that great. They were more clinical than us. They had two goals on the counter late, but it did not seem like they could be a title contending or supporter shield contending team just based off of this one performance. They don't, but like then again, you don't have to do a whole lot to to beat us these days. Yeah, I was but they probably have games where they look like Galacticos. But, but how many misplaced passes did we see from them? Just like sloppy touches taking too long on the ball. So like <laughs> the simple things that a good team should do no matter what. And it would happen. Hundred percent. Like no doubt the O C B games we go to watch, I've probably probably seen more accurate passes at those. But like <laughs> you do what you gotta do to get the job done. And against us, it's really not much. Yeah, I mean, you guys kind of touched on the next talking point I have, and that's the fact that we don't ever see any real adjustments from us as a team throughout a match. Um, LAFC was really comfortable to sit in their sit in their shape and just allow us to pass the ball around outsides and, and ping a ball in the box, hope for the best. Zach said it, those 8% of passes were us trying to be more direct, trying to make things happen, trying to break lines, find spaces, and we're just not doing that. Um Something that I noticed real early in the game, though, that like separates the good teams from us is you can see those on-field adjustments right off the bat. We saw Boanga bouncing around trying to find his matchup. He wanted to see who he wanted to play against, and the team was working around him. Whenever we see us trying to find matchups or moving around, it always ends up being Facundo, Angulo, Lodero, Caesar, Duncan, Muriel, all within two yards of each other. Yeah, the the matchup is right there between Facundo, Ojeda, and Lodero. Like I was telling these guys beforehand, there was a point in the match, I want to say it was in the buildup to one of uh, LAFC's goals, that there was a ball that was played out probably to where you'd see a number 10 sitting usually. And I want to say it was those three, Facundo, Ojeda, and Lodero, but I could be wrong, but I know for a fact there were three players all fighting for the same ball. <laughs> and that's something you just... <laughs> At the top level of U.S. football, come on now. Where's the spacing? Where's the where's the IQ at? Yeah, and you can't even blame a manager for something like that. That's so elementary. Like, spacing on the field is something that you learn <clears throat> at the very beginning levels of this sport. It's not that hard to understand. You shouldn't have to be coached up on... Hey, don't stand right on top of somebody. But the thing that fixes that is there's going to be space on the other side of the field when that happens, when there's overloads on certain sides of the field. And we see Dagger Dan standing over there. Could fucking pick grass with toothpicks. (laughs) But he decides to just stand there, and it takes us 18 passes to get it to him finally, and the whole defense already switched. So if pick grass with toothpicks? Yeah. Just like this. <laughs> not chopsticks. No, nah, toothpicks. Toothpicks hurt. They're pointy, you get it. But it's not only that, it's the fact that we give it to him when there's about two to three defenders on him. And so now he's scrambling his ass back to just try to find a decent ball. Well, it's because it takes 18 passes to get it there. So exactly. Like I feel so bad for him because me and Kanat <laughs> staring at him. It's like big switch. Switch. And it said do the we, thing. We, tiki Taka between Rafael, Facundo, Ladero, Ojeda, Schlegel. all in that one little corner out left. <laughs> Schlegel right. switching it back the other way when we're all clearly trying to move the ball one direction. Dan's running his ass back and forth. He's gassed. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, my man of the match, Dan, I feel so sorry for you right now. I feel like even that tactical situation is just elementary, too. If you have a certain amount of players on one side of the field, one guy's wide open on the edge of the box on the other side of the field, you make one big switch, you're in a beautiful attacking moment at that time, and you have three, four players crashing the back post and probably still Duncan standing around the penalty spot. 
I can't remember where it was, but there was a cross that Angulo had. He just, he just did it direct, and this is where we were saying if Angulo plays direct, then he can be useful. He took it to the byline, just kind of chip crossed it back post, and Dagger Dan was there to finish it. It's not exactly outside the 18 and just a big switch, but it's the same principle, and quick switch can result in something good. But here we are. As this wasn't the game to do it in because LAFC was just packing the box and we saw multiple times crosses go in and they were just in there to clear it out. But same principle of just switch the damn ball. Well, my thing is when you see Dagger Dan in that much space or even Santos in that much space, it doesn't even have to be a good switch. The nearest defender is 15, 20 yards away. Like you've got time to either let that person get to that ball or if it's that bad, they can be in a good put position to defend it. It's it doesn't have to be a pitch perfect ball every single time. Just hit the, hit the damn ball. Make them be honest. But I also feel like low key it might boil down to the manager because I see times where Robin looks up at him and it's like he wants to play the ball, but he stops himself. Don't know if that's purely tactical or if Robin doesn't trust himself to play that ball. But like I've I've seen it happen where. Robbins noticed it. Maybe if it's on his right foot. No, on his left. Like on his left, like it it's ready for him to be pinged, but it's he rolls it back, plays it back out to Raphael. The form of everybody's been subpar. That's to say that's to put it a nice way. It's been atrocious for quite a few players on this team. And I don't think anything could epitomize one player season so far more than Facundo Torres's penalty. I, I can't even call it an effort. The time he went up there and, and tried to kick a ball. He whacked it. Yeah. That was just right over there. <laughs> Everybody said it. I heard a couple of people say it in the stadium. Theme of the year is honor thy history. So we had to uh, honor the boy himself. Rivas had to get it out there somewhere at some point. Um, yeah, that is just not good. Austin David put out a tweet during the game. That was his first miss on a penalty in his entire career. Now, not to say that he hasn't had penalties saved. That's happened, obviously. But first miss in his entire professional career. His confidence is in the gutter. <laughs> the fact that we have one shot on target and it's not a pen is mind-blowing. There's not really many words to say at this point. Just on the fact of Facundo's confidence might be the most shot out of any athlete that I have followed at least semi-closely. And I watched Kai Havertz at Chelsea. The Timo Werner at Chelsea. There's no there's no belief in himself. or It doesn't even feel like there's belief that he has in his teammates. And when that happens, if you're cooked. So there's, I don't know if there's a way out of it, but it needs to be found pretty quickly or else it's going to be very easy for fans to not be on his side as if that's already not happened. I feel like the way you do get him back on that confidence, you, Oscar's going to have to make a hard decision. And for me, if he misses that penalty, he's already low on confidence. He's not going to fucking build on confidence throughout that game. For me, I'm taking him out right then. He's could, gonna could it, kill it. It could kill it, but it could also get him moving and be like, "Oh shit!" Gotta like it finally up. happened. I got fucking benched. Maybe I should figure something out. So at this point, he shouldn't even come close to starting eleven. Hell no! Nah. Especially with Ojeda, Ojeda starting. I know. I don't. Fernando's cooked right now, and he has to figure it out. And for me, it yeah, might, it might have to be a hard decision from Oscar. I think the problem with Facundo, <clears throat> I'll touch on that more in one of the other topics. So you guys can go ahead and continue. Sorry. I don't know if I had much more to say, to be honest. It's, yeah, it's just a move that has to be made. Facundo's done great, but I mean, he's regressed so much since we've brought him in from, was it Penarol? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the name of the club from Penarol in, what, two and a half years ago? Yep. Something you hate to see, especially with the links that he's been getting the past couple of years. You know, Arsenal, 
um, other clubs out in Europe. For him to go from that player to the one that we see now, it just sucks. If something, if an offer comes in for him, and it's two mil under what we pay for him, are you taking it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Fine. <laughs> you, yeah, go forge his signature. Let's see what happens. No. <laughs> and it's gonna be Bryce's signature. Bryce Miller says he's gone. I think we got it for let's just say nine mil, just to be easy. Seven mil comes in from Ajax. I take two. Well, that says a lot. Dude, I'm I'm yeah. sorry. I'm I'm getting tired of seeing him not be able to use his right foot. It and then sickening. him just not taking on anyone, either turning his back instantly, finding a quick pass backwards, or just dribbling on his left and someone taking it right off his left foot because they know he's not going to cut to his right. Every touch, or not every, but almost every touch, I swear I remember was backwards. At least his first touch when he would get the ball. First touch backwards, first touch backwards. He's lost his confidence in himself, so he doesn't want to try to go forward because if he loses the ball, it's just going to hurt him even more. So he just tries to do the simple thing, bring it backwards, complete a pass, know that he didn't lose the ball, and then it's kind of like the safe play. And then we usher him in with a penalty, you know, probably one of the safest things you can do. And Still looking yeah, for the so ball. Someone that uh, has also regressed, in my opinion, especially over the past couple of weeks, is... Cesar. Don't get me started. Uh, it's a talking point, my friend. We have to talk about it. What was it? It was possible, like a newcomer or rookie of the year uh-huh. in the first season here. And now I take 250K plus a bubble bath for him. I'm I'm done. Mm. Sure. <laughs> 250 in a Caesar salad. <laughs> Caesar salad. There you go. Mm, Caesar salad bag. might be asking for too much. What a small bag Still of gold. croutons. Caesar salad, not tossed. So you're gonna what? Yeah, it's just all the it ingredients. So, yeah. oh. <laughs> no, it's incredible. We, I was looking at his stats before this. That man was dribbled past seven times in one match. There was a season in which Virgil Van Dyke did not get dribbled past. It was either zero times or one time. This man got dribbled past seven times. The effort was so low. He just didn't see. He didn't seem like he wanted to be there. Doesn't have a care in the world. And then on Buanga's the, the what is it, the third goal, Buanga's second. Schlegel puts in a tackle. Buanga gets the ball back, and then Araujo gets megged. And he again just doesn't look like he cares. But no, let's not try to fight and get a two-two result. Let's just let him score three-one. And I, I would have had some words for that man if I was in the tunnel after the match. Honestly, that game eerily reminded me of Casemiro against Palace. Oh, like that's what it reminded that's me depressing. of, and that was bad. Yeah. And there's no, no, no. you're saying, you know, if an offer for Casemiro comes in. It's a fair comparison, Dave. It's a it's fair comparison. Araujo. The only difference is one is just starting his career, and one's at the back end of his career. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like that's more acceptable. None it's of it's acceptable. acceptable. Yeah. But he's just older, so you expect more of those to happen rather than a one player we saw. against quality talent, one is against that as well. The MLS. I was going to try to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he's played a lot recently, blah, blah, blah. It was with Uruguay, but I don't think he really played all that much because he was with the first team. I could be wrong. And then we've had here, at least we've had a two-week break just in uh, league play. So I don't think there's really much of an excuse to be playing very lackluster and lazy. And it's, like you can have a bad game and there can be an excuse for that. But if you look lazy and you're not showing effort and you have a bad game, there's no excuse. That's the quickest way to fall out of favor with everybody in this club is for you to not put effort in at this point in time, especially not a damn player on that team has an excuse to not put 150% every single time they step out in that field. We are in a predicament. I'll rephrase that. Y'all motherfuckers are in a predicament. I just show up and cheer y'all on. I do this stupid podcast. We go out there and get re- reactions. I can't influence what goes on the, f- on the field. Y'all get paid to do that. You know what I mean? So y'all are in a predicament. You got to fix it. And when you show up and you don't put effort in, I'm done with you. 
it's maybe the first time that we've seen that low of quality from him, and it has been a steady decline. So it's not like get out now, but if it continues to happen, it will be a very swift and quick. I never want to see this man on the pitch again. Yep. You had your high here, and thank you for that. But if you're going to keep doing, if you're going to go like this, maybe you don't want to be here. Fine. Go ahead. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. How much does it come down to not playing alongside uh, Wilder? So that was going to be my next question. Is he, We talked about it a little bit before the season about who would we want to play that lone six if we had to do that. And we all kind of were like, well, we don't know if Caesar can do it, but we feel like maybe that's the guy that would be better there. And I feel like it's been proven time and time again, and especially last week, that he just can't be a lone six. He has to have the double pivot. That's just the type of player he is at this point in time. Yeah, uh, but the problem is, Wilder hasn't looked great this season either. Like, it's just looked very average from midfield that a year ago we thought was probably one of the best in the MLS. Wilders look great at center back, though. He has. Uh, I was just looking to see uh, what the timeline was for when each of them got here. Caesar got here January 2022. Wielder got here August 2022. So we're just, sorry. Caesar had a little bit of time to play before Wielder got here. And that's almost when he looked the best is when he first got here. So I don't know if you can, can you chalk it up to it not being with Wielder? Because if he had possibly, possibly his best time here, one of his best times here, and it was without Wielder, then that's not really a valid argument. Nobody like had I, Urso. Yeah. Lodero works just as hard as Urso. Lodero runs just as much as Urso. Lodero does not defend as well as Urso did. Urso was a box-to-box midfielder by every definition of the word. He would give everything he did in the attacking third as he would in the defensive third. Lodero will quit in the defensive third. He will run, but he's not a defender. He's never really had to do that that much. That may be the problem with Caesar because we all know Caesar's passing range is not great, if not non-existent. And when he can't defend, what does he bring to the table? The body on the pitch. That's really what he is. Like he just occupies space, and when he's getting blown by seven times in the game, there's nothing else for him to do. There's nothing else for him to offer to us. He's not going to ping a ball out wide. He rarely swings it out. He's not going to carry it either. One two with his midfield partner dropping it into to Robin. Every now and then, he'll find Ladero or Facundo. So I don't want to take this too off track, but how does this come down to not recognizing that a player is having an absolute shitter and not bringing him off and bringing on a, a Kochevsky or a Felipe? Because it was evident to me in the first half that he it was not Caesar's day. There were multiple players that you could have brought off, and there were multiple players in the second half that were also very tired that didn't get brought off in time. But the obvious one to me felt like Caesar because, again, it wasn't his day. Why is he not coming off when we have at least two midfield subs that can come on and do a better job? No, this was perfect. It pivots us to our next conversation, and that's the man at the helm. We, we've got to have that conversation now. It's that point in time. We've kind of quietly had the conversation. We've said that, you know, if things turn around, if things turn around, if things turn around, we now sit second to last in the East – one point ahead of New England, and they have a game in hand on us. So technically, we are the last team in the East. I believe it's one point. I could be wrong. It is but, one point, 17, and there is 16. So, yeah, it's it comes down to the ineptitude that we have at the head coach. Uh, yeah. Like you said, we've been, quote-unquote, quietly having this conversation over here for at least the past year, year and a half. Year. And it kind of quieted down when it, we started winning again last season. But again, stats unsustainable. We were overperforming. That wasn't always going to happen. Now, did we ever think that it was going to get this bad this year? Absolutely not. I think some of us had us winning the East, second, third place, whatnot. 
Um, obviously, the only thing that we can win this season is a golden spoon. Golden spoon, dear Lord, wooden spoon. Definitely not golden. <laughs> so It's gold-plated. Gold-plated wooden spoon? Yeah. I'd want a trip to <laughs> Well, <laughs> trip to Cancun was coming at the very what was it decision day? I don't know before that. Yeah, so we've been having this conversation. We got ridiculed for it a lot, um, but it's like it's there's no defending it at this point. And you can say just give it till the end of the season, but it, at this point, can you get can you get worse? No. So is there any harm in doing the thing? No. So, talking point, I kind of put it in the group chat and gave you guys a little bit of time to think about it. Let's, I'm interested to hear what you guys came up with, but everybody wants to know what's the problem. What, what's going on? We'll go down the line. You go first. What is going on? Um, <clears throat> I feel like it's a mix of three of our DPs are underperforming slash not performing at all. I think another part of a huge part of it is our coach not being able to make tactical decisions that would help improve our team and our DP functionality right now. And whether it's in trainings or on match day, making decisions quickly on the fly, he just doesn't do it. And then he also fucking doesn't use his subs, like you were saying. Caesar probably shouldn't have played the second half. You just tell it wasn't his day, but we're going to wait till I'm just going to throw a number out here. Like the 75th minute, maybe we used our first sub. I could be completely wrong, but he late subs for him too. He doesn't make those decisions early in the second half of games. 69th. No. Nice. That was the only one. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. We made two subs, right? It was Jacqueline and. Oh, Jacqueline did come on. Wait, no. Oh, no, two, 61st. I'm sorry. I was reading oh. goals. 61st, Ojeda on for Angulo, and 78th, Jacqueline on for Duncan. So two subs out of five. After I watched Dan run his ass back and forth up and down the field, and after he was and he probably was on, on their touchline, and he puts his head down like, fuck, I got to run back. Probably a sign that you should take him off, right? So you, you're... Quick synopsis. Subs. DPs aren't performing. Mm -hmm. Substitutions and tactics. I mean, I feel like that sums sums it up decently. Um, If I had to try to make it a little bit different, I could say that the DP situation could be on the front office as well as Oscar, depending on how the recruiting went, to have three of your DPs, all three of your DPs, want to try and play in the same position on the field is a mistake in and of itself. You could have three DP attackers, but they all have to mesh in a certain way, have different play styles, and not want to do the exact same thing. So depending on where certain decisions came from, front office or Oscar, and then you could say that's also on Oscar for not being able to figure out who he has to bench, who he has to start, tough decisions to make, uh, whether it comes to Muriel and Duncan playing as a in a two-striker system, Oh, hey, just starting over Facundo based on form. Um, and yeah, you, you could get into substitutions. It's always too late or too little. As we saw this game, it was too little and semi too late, or just not even not even take a Caesar off. Um, that or Dan off. I could ramble incoherently, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of different things that you could say and I was having a hard time trying to put it into words in a, in a short little synopsis but it could it could move into the front office depending on the certain scenarios fair um I guess I could be really different I don't know what really goes on inside the locker room but I feel like when it, when it's not going great for a player, sometimes you have to sit sit them for a game or two, or if you know they're out of control or whatnot. I feel like he may be lacking in just like balls. Like sometimes you just have to like. There's just no other way to put it. Like sometimes you have to have the balls to just say like, "Listen, you you've played 15 games this season. You've got two goals. 
you're our striker, let's say. You got to be better. He's playing, not you. Like, sometimes that's just what it boils down to. And I feel like we don't see that of Oscar at all. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys hit all the points pretty much. I, the only other thing that I, I've kind of noticed, and it kind of goes online with what Zach said, is that we don't have a true play, playmaker on this team. Um, we didn't replace Mauricio. We thought we did, but we didn't replace that type of tempo setter, somebody that can break the lines, be able to pick up spaces. Um, and then we did not really replace Antonio Carlos. Now, Brecolo is a huge talent, and I think he could develop, but he's had some injury issues being in and out of the team, obviously, with international duty. He hasn't really grown in. We saw Antonio be able to be that person that would switch the field, be able to you know, play the long ball, play the accurate long ball. Antonio was never afraid to carry the ball forward and take up spaces. We haven't really seen Brecolo do that, so I think that's a huge part of what made our team successful last year versus this year. Now, Schlegel did have that eight-game run at the end of the year, and he looked all right. But to get us to that point, obviously, I feel like Antonio was huge in that and his ability to make def defenses respect him when he had the ball. The other big problem that I have is that Oscar Perea can't develop young talent. It should not be an, a problem that we're talking about a 23-year-old striker, or I'm sorry, winger, coming from Uruguay that has consistently regressed in two and a half years. Those are the prime educational years of a player's life. Though that you, you should see jump after jump after jump after jump. Name a young player in this under Oscar Pereira that has gotten better. I'll one up you. Name anyone under Oscar who's gotten better. Daryl DK. But I feel like he was already that good. He's an so <laughs> he just got the exposure. He just got the exposure is all it was. But other than that, I didn't know one because Duncan was that good too. Could you make a case for Rafael Santos? No. I feel like he's not. I think strong, is he? he had a good well, I don't I said anyone in general, but oh. Rafael Santos had a good run of games. What has he done this season? Well, it's not his fault that it's just play it out wide to him and then hit it and pray someone's in the box. So I'll say he didn't look good in the preseason game that we saw him in, but obviously, you know, preseason, nobody ever looks good. Petrasso comes in, gets a couple, gets a run of games, and then he gets hurt, and Santos comes in and slots into this team immediately. So, again, I think it was just a case of he was new, didn't have a lot of time with the team, then he got integrated, and he's he's fit in since. I, don't, I can't think of anybody that he's made better in their entire time here. Our last hat trick was Chris Mueller, you said, right? And MLS is back, which oh, I'm not even counting that. Me oh, and yeah, okay. I, I could be wrong. I don't know if it happened, but I, I just know he had a good tournament. And for some reason, so, trick was on my mind, but I could be wrong. But the last one I know for sure is Kyle Laren is the last Orlando City player to score a hat trick. Way before him. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, hat trick isn't really like a fair metric. No, really but it's like. You 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 gotta be able to score goals, brother. Like we play some really bad teams here in the MLS. <laughs> well, then don't you don't really do it based off hat trick. You could do it based off goals per game and how many times per season. I just think it's a interesting statistic. Yeah. Out of all the pro prolific scorers that we've seen come through this this team since then, you know. I think it's an interesting statistic. I don't think it's ind indicative of anything, but it's just a very interesting statistic. Does Ladero's hat trick of assists count from this year? <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's a big thing for me is Oscar can't develop. I, I said young talent, but you guys are right. Any talent, to be honest with you. I'm trying to think. No, because you, I thought about that, and you saying young talent brought it up in my mind again. That he's never made anyone better. Like good coaches, they'll see talent, they'll usually one up it. They'll make them better in some sort of facet. But we've just seen regression, honestly, in probably fifty, seventy-five percent of the players that we've seen under Oscar. Someone already say Wielder. Or no, no. Based Was, off of last season, like he got it better. That. I mean, he did turn the team into a double pivot, which then 
made Caesar and Wilder one of the best variants <clears throat> in the league. And you can't deny it. I will that. say, yeah. Last year. No, I will say that was a good decision. That was a good decision. You know, props is due where props is due. That was a smart thing. He found that pairing. They played well together, but obviously, it, you know, we overperformed and it was unsustainable from what we see now, you know. So that's one total. So brings us into the last question, which is what's next? Keep Oscar for the last bit of his contract. Bring no. in Pep Guardiola. No. <laughs> no. How about OC Fan TV takeover at manager until Pep co- becomes available, and then let the. What if we go and win the league, though? I don't want Pep. Uh, he can be like. No, brother, you can pay me what you want to pay Pep. Consult us on decisions. Be like, hey, we could do this. OC be like. No, brother, you saw. Yeah, well, I could you tell saw Pep. Pep at the Celtics game. Fuck off. But yeah, now they're Pep. up three not to win it tonight. <laughs> Look, no, Pep is dying to play with inverted guards. You know it. So <laughs> that might be that might be what he's gonna go do. He can go ruin that sport with his with false his possession based false center. False center inverted guards. He can go do that and then we'll stay here and coach Orlando City. It can't get worse, can it? Bring him to the magic. No. Well, that's what I'm saying. Basketball in general. <laughs> that's fair. Okay, really? Yeah, I mean, what is next? Uh, I, I don't know. You couldn't pay me enough to try to find an answer. <laughs> I think or- I mean it more from the optic of, like, obviously we're all on the board of there's going to have to be a, a manager change at some point, whether we do it now, whether we de- wait till the end of the year and see what happens. This isn't sustainable. Are we looking at the prospect of having to completely rebuild this team now? For me, I was going to say we should have already sacked Oscar. We should be in the manager hunt right now. Get a new manager before the end of summer. Let him finish out the season with the team that he has now and then go into the winter. And I think we might be at the, the point of rebuild, especially around our dps i mean the thing is like we we've talked about on the podcast last year we had a whole list of managers that could have come in and probably done a lot of good for us now a lot of them are signed to different clubs i feel like we may have waited too long to find a really good manager we may have to just settle for a manager at this point Uh, truthfully we're we're not gonna go get some big manager over from europe It's going to be someone that we have never heard of from South America to come in and try to do this. I don't. Before Orlando City hired Oscar Pereja, I don't know if I maybe I'd heard his name just through MLS channels, but it's not like I really followed what he had did or well, basically just followed what he did. So it's going to be another one of those. We're going to go try to find another youngish manager. It seems just to be the way football is going realistically is you got to find the next young manager that has this idea that's the next pep uh, speaking from experience with that one well let's just find pep's man city academy coach and that was bring him over. yeah we, we already got him already precisely got so sorry that's that's what i'm saying we waited too long all the good options are gone unless we James go to south america o'connor Redemption arc. Yes, with Jason Christ as the assistant <laughs> coach. And Seb Hines just water boying it up. Oh, no, let that man stay I'm with kidding, the pride. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He's doing class. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. It just kind of depends on who we bring in next, whether or not we're looking at a rebuild. You know, it's like we said, it depends on the identity and the way that the new manager wants to play. We've got three DPs. And like what three goals between them, um, four maybe now oh. with Ojeda's. So either way, no over under six. I'm saying under. Um, yeah, might be six. I think they might each have two. So that's just pathetic across 17, 18 games at this point. Um, so not utilizing. How many goals? Five. 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 
Ojeda has one. Fundo has two. And uh, Mariel has two. Mariel has two. Yeah, yeah, so that's great. We're averaging one goal from our DPs every three games. Um, Less than. Yeah. That's great. We're We're doing great. So I think we've got some hard decisions to make. And I think now's the time to do it. I mean, League's Cup is a perfect time for let, to let a new manager just kind of have a go at it and see what's going on. I mean, that cut, that tournament means nothing. It might as well just be some glorified friendlies. So you get some yeah. time away from the league, and then you try to resurrect it. Use that as the time for the – even if it's the only the two group stage games and we don't even get out, let him use those two matches as a time to figure stuff out, let the players play into it. And if you get knocked out after those two matches, guess what? Mm-hmm. You have a month on the training pitch to figure it out. So, I, as much as the League's Cup is not good, <laughs> when you want to hire a new manager, it could possibly come in handy. It could save our entire season. It, when, it could turn it around and get us into a spot to get into the playoffs. When does that start? Like mid July or something? I can probably find that out. Because we're getting down to the wire where they better have a name in mind if they're planning also, to go that route. Also, with the transfer window coming up, it would be really beneficial to get in the new manager. Well, I heard if we, we decide to. to do I heard we aren't making any moves this season. We may not be able to. Tom but Bogert. Even yeah, as of right now, outgoings even in, incomings, like now would be the time to get someone in. So the first, our first League Cup game is July twenty sixth versus Montreal, who oh, we that's... would lose to. Oh, same. Atletico de San Luis, August 4th. I think they're garbage in their league. If I'm... Yeah, well, so are we. So, in our league. <laughs> Probably joint bottom. Uh, yeah, so I think it's coming up on that time. Uh, Wednesday, it's going to be tough to get points. And then Saturday, we play Chicago. I know we've said it a couple of times, and we've gotten results in that time span to kind of extend it. If we don't get four points in the next two matches, he has to go. It would have to be a win against Chicago because I don't see us going into Charlotte right now. No, and right. Also, to add on top of that, Charlotte's just gone on like a grim reaping streak so far with uh-huh. headquarters. Nashville first, then Atlanta. Now we're up next. That I wouldn't I would not be mad. No, Charlotte end him. Fan TV. Come on. Honestly. Yeah. Are they the new kings of the south? Hell no. Charlotte? Yeah. Hell no. <laughs> this season. Right now. Right now it ain't us. And unfortunately, we're probably waiting to lose to Charlotte to be like to add on to the Charlotte narrative. Oh, a hundred percent. They already got it mocked up. I can tell you that for sure. And we're gonna get tagged by Everyone. Charlotte fan TV. Hundred percent. Oh. Then again, there's some good lads over there though. They deserve it. Oh, for sure. But Yeah, it's that time. Like I said, we've we've got to get a draw in Charlotte and a win against Chicago to for him to have his to keep his job. We lose in Charlotte, it's over. We lose against Chicago or draw against Chicago, it's over. We drew against them last time. It was like five matches ago, six matches ago. Yep. So, I feel a one point week coming up. You feel what? A one point week. Oh, and, like, watch this be the uh, week. You, you really th- flips it fucking around. No, and he gets six points, and then with like the cycle starts again. You know, you know what I'll do? What I'd let him get his six points, and I'd fucking sack his bitch ass. Like, Thanks for finally doing your job. Now get the fuck out. No, because you know what it's going to be is it's going to be the same bull crap that we see where we hold a team to a nil nil and then we get some jammy goal in the 80th minute to save this man's job in That's both games. Don't it's, like, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> like knowing us, it would happen. We'd have him for another two years and it's just the same cycle over and over again. I mean, we we held we, we broke uh, LAFC's. Uh, shutout streak. So extend the man for ten years. Yeah, we had, we scored not on a pen, by the way, which we had on a <laughs> a, a nice Ojeda goal. So off we're in for ten years, maybe fifteen. If we get a point against Charlotte, maybe add on the five years. From what I heard, Oscar told 
Muriel to chip it over the LAFC back line. That was his tactical genius to uh, get yeah. away. So add five years onto that contract. So we're talking about lifetime contract now at this point, right? We made the playoffs for what three years in a row, four years in a row. Three. I don't know, MLS. So back. it's thirty so, years each. That's another well, post mortem to his contract. So even while he's no longer alive, he'll still be the manager of Orlando City. This is the first manager to get the purple bloodline from the season ticket thing. So the family <laughs> members just get. Jesus. <laughs> Well, we laugh because that's all we can do at this point. Hopefully, decisions are made here shortly because that's the only way I can see this season getting any better. I'm going to be honest with you. At this point, when you see the way the team reacts after that second goal and the body language and the demeanor, I think uh, one of the guys from Lions Den said it uh, doesn't seem like they're playing for the manager anymore and trying to trying to keep him here, like, like we've seen. Last year. Mm. So, you know, all I'm going to say, acknowledge the original poppy out bloodline over here. We were the ones that started it. Yes, brother. Jesus Christ. I I, I didn't think that we could have held it up any longer for y'all to get the hint that that's what you got to do when the ones come out. They don't understand it like we do. I, I understand they don't understand it. It's because they don't acknowledge their their tribal chief. I thought so, you were bringing up candles, to think, asking God to get Poppy out. <laughs> yeah, we might have to do that church vigil. <laughs> One thing well, I mentioned before we end is after I believe I can't remember if it was the second or third goal, but the flood of fans oof, that just the third. left. We were in the middle of a conversation, you and, and me and Kanata. And then I looked over to my right and I saw them flooding down the staircase. And I had to interrupt the conversation because I've never seen yep. anything like that in that stadium ever. And it's very unfortunate that we've got to that point. But I think fans will eventually start to show where they are if we haven't already. And it's gonna it's gonna start to hurt. I remember a long time ago we were sitting at like seventeen, sixteen. Even down to 14, 14,000 yeah. fans coming out every match, and now we're 21, 22 building every game, and it's just the results are going down and down. And that just seeing that amount of people leave the stadium like that is just a sign of what's to come if things don't change and people are held accountable at any level. The unfortunate thing behind it is the only way to convey it to the front office and the owners in a way that's tangible is to affect their wallets. Um, and by walking out and people not showing up and, and seeing that this is not going to help them continue to grow their brand is really going to make, make the point and drive home the point. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we protest or that we don't show up to games, any of that stuff. I'm not, but I'm just saying the casuals will stop coming. We've seen it before. It'll happen again. And that's what will ultimately drive their decision pretty much well Riley asked us to say one good thing um told him this isn't the show for that but i will give robin johnson his props um man literally yeah that's our tribal chief we will acknowledge robin johnson for another um, nordic yeah jeez he Literally, we probably would have been down eight goals in that game if he didn't do the few things that he did to save that. So there's your there's your good thing, Riley. You're welcome. Other than that, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed what you heard here today, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe button. If you're commiserating with us, hit that like button and subscribe button either way. Um, in the description is the link to all our socials. Make sure you check that stuff out. Discord, get your asses in there. It's a good time, good conversation, and you get input on the show. We always like to hear from you guys. So good community, good people. And then go ahead and check out our Patreon. It's only a couple dollars a month. There's some really good content on there. We've taken a little break from posting. Apologies to all of you guys that are on there. We will get back to it. But go ahead and keep rewatching the exclusive stuff that you got access to to hold you over until we get back to it. <laughs> Um, 
Thank you all for watching again, and we'll see you on the next time. <laughs>